Okay. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for connecting on this call as we continue to learn from the Book of Acts. We've been observing the growth of the church, the movement of the church, the impact of the church. And particularly, we've also looked at the life of a man known as Apostle Paul, uh, who began his missionary journeys uh, along with others. And uh, right now, we are at a place where we have seen him go through the first initial two journeys. He's on his third journey now. And he's heading towards Jerusalem. So we understood in the last class that he took some time to speak to the Ephesian elders and he strengthened them in God, knowing that he may never see them ever again. So that's where we were at in Acts chapter 20. We will pray. I'll go back to that same passage and uh, begin to explain. I request one of us on the call to go ahead and lead in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we're about to have. God, uh, we just pray that you'll help us to remember everything that we learned from the previous class uh, as we are learning about uh, how supernatural and how amazing are your works and how much we can do as believers, as a church, God. I just pray that uh, you will guide us, you will help us uh, to open our mind and heart and listen to it and not just listen, but just apply it in our life, Jesus, so that we can be witnesses of you, so that we can uh, stand as testimonies of your gospel, God so that we can preach the gospel much more boldly down here on this earth. We just give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jafina. So we were at uh, Acts 20. The section where uh, Paul is exhorting the efficient elders. I'll come back to it, but before we read the key thoughts that Paul presented to encourage the elders, keep them going in God, strengthen them, we'll quickly have a look at uh, the map once again. I think it's always helpful because then it orients you to what exactly is going on. Otherwise, uh, there are way too many names and uh, you may all get confused. So just going back to the map quickly. Yes, there you go. This is the third missionary journey. And if you can recall, it began in Antioch. They went in the upper region or the Galatia region. And then you know they continued on to uh, Troas for a short while uh, you know they kind of came to ephesus but he didn't really stay there uh, he sent uh, others and then he he went on to asos troas and we saw that he spent more time in the macedonian region than of course achaia and then you know uh, came back right he came back all the way now on the way back is where uh, um, we Oh, sorry, this is a third missionary journey, right? So he spent a lot of time in Ephesus. So initially, the second missionary journey, when he was completing it, he had just stopped by in Ephesus. But in the third missionary journey, he spent a lot of time there. And uh, while returning is when he doesn't want to go to Ephesus because of the opposition. That's when he calls the elders to come from Ephesus to a close-by place known as Miletus. And this is where the whole... Uh, speech or uh, you may want to call it a sermon or a heart to heart uh, talk to the elders of the efficient church is happening and from there he will continue on his journey so uh, we we saw you know a couple of incidents earlier uh, where uh, we we saw that uh, 
when uh, Paul was in Troas and he was uh, preaching over there, there was a man who fell down and uh, Paul was able to manifest the supernatural power of God in order to raise that uh, man up and uh, he continued to minister there as well. And then, you know, the, the journey continued and finally here, here he is in Ephesus. From Ephesus, as we read on uh, and different names of places, just have a look because you will see these names again, Kos, uh, Rhodes, Patara, then you would see like uh, uh, Tyre and come to Caesarea and finally to Jerusalem. So just remember these names so that it kind of helps you know what exactly is going on. We are over here now. We are in Miletus. Okay. So now let's continue. Coming back to uh, the talk that Paul had, we said that uh, Paul encouraged them he also showed them that he has led by example. That's why he said things like, uh, you know what manner I always lived among you. So it teaches us about the pattern of leadership. Uh, leadership has got to do with the life example that one sets before the people. And so uh, uh, Paul led by example. And Paul led from front. And he also talks about how he walked in humility. He walked uh, uh, in trials. Uh, he walked through a lot of challenges, which again is an encouragement for the leaders, knowing that if their leader or someone who has gone before them could face those things well, they too can face it. So that was one particular um, uh, one key subject that he touched upon. Then he also went on to uh, talk about how he did the ministry faithfully. And so uh, his responsibility he has fulfilled. Now, whether people have repented, whether they have accepted his message, that is totally dependent on them. But his part he has done. That again shows us that as a leader, he fulfilled his responsibilities. And that's a great lesson for us to learn from him. He also suggests to them that this journey that he's making would lead him towards Jerusalem, where he uh, shares that he feels bound in the spirit, explaining that there are problems or there uh, uh, is some sort of a danger awaiting him in Jerusalem. So he is clear that uh, he has, uh, if you want to call it, heard from God or has this impression from God about what is coming next. So he is being very vulnerable to the people and sharing with them about uh, uh, the fact that this may be the last time that he is going to meet them. And he also goes on to uh, exhort them. And he says that, uh, you know, uh, he's happy about serving God. He's happy about the way uh, he, he has uh, ministered so far. And uh, uh, he is happy that he's going to finish the race or he's going to finish the assignment. And then in the last uh, class, we were discussing a little bit about, you know, uh, the way he describes this position of oversight or pastoral role uh, or, or even the teaching role where he says things like uh, it is the Holy Spirit who has made you overseers of the church. So the responsibility comes from the Holy Spirit or comes from God. It's not so much that uh, uh, we want to become and so, you know, we became leaders or uh, uh, we became uh, elders over the flock of Jesus Christ. So responsibility, leadership comes from God. Uh, and then he also talks about how he ministered faithfully the whole counsel of God. I think that's what we were talking about in the last uh, section, last session, the whole counsel of God. And uh, we said that, you know, one must be careful, um, especially when it comes to the teaching ministry to ensure that they are, they are, uh, dividing the word of God correctly, the right interpretation, because that would lead to the application, the right application of the word of God in people's lives. So that again is a responsibility 
of a leader or a pastor. Now, apart from this, uh, Paul did make these statements uh, warning the believers, saying that he knows that once he has gone, there will be, he uses the term, savage wolves among you. So who, whom is he referring to? He's referring to people who probably had a, a selfish agenda among the believers itself. Now, these people, their agenda was not to extend the kingdom of God or to fulfill the Great Commission uh, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, any any godly intention. But their desire was to become, it was more like a selfish uh, desire. And so he's giving them uh, a prior warning and he's saying don't be surprised if you find such people in your midst and um, maybe even at the time when he was serving he had some such people whom he observed so he wanted the people to be very careful uh, about how they would take care of of uh, their congregation and god's flock and uh, to make sure that they preserved everything which was taught by him to the people. So no, he states, look, three years uh, I was with you. I taught you. I warned you day and night. So basically what he's saying is he had done a good work and he had put some strong foundations for the people to build their lives on. Now, he is charging the leaders and he's saying, don't let this foundation be moved in any way. There will be people who will come in now, they can influence uh, in various ways. They can uh, bring in some wrong teaching. They can uh, minister by a wrong spirit. Uh, these, are, these are matters that leaders or elders should be alert about. And when they pick up that something like this is going on, they must protect the sheep or the congregation. So when it comes to leadership, we learn so many lessons here from Paul's life, lessons such as, um, you know, lead by example, lead from the front, go through difficulties uh, with, with a brave spirit, demonstrate integrity, humility. We also see being vulnerable with the people as and when required. Know, in, in, in certain matters, uh, he talks about the way he took on responsibility, even sacrificially at times. He talks about how he preached the, the gospel and uh, ensured that all men heard the gospel. And he also talks about how faithfully you know, he taught the people. Uh, he was careful to teach the whole counsel of God's word. Uh, he now charges the elders and believers and says, remember that responsibility of leadership has come from the Holy Spirit. You need to take care of the sheep. You need to protect them, especially uh, in the case of false leaders, false prophets, apostles, teachers, all of them rising up am uh, among the brethren itself. So these were the key points that Paul focused on. So at this point that he had shared whatever was on his heart, uh, he gives them into God's hands and, uh, you know, he prays a prayer or uh, in other words, it's it's more like the cry of his heart. He says, uh, I commit you, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. So he has now taught the people the word so well. So he is sure that the word will now guide them. He may not be there personally, but uh, what has he done? He has input the word. He has imparted the word. Now that's quite a challenge for us uh, as uh, leaders and as pastors, as teachers. So what is it that we are imparting into the lives of people? What is it that will give them a strong anchor in God? Uh, let's say we move on with uh, the calling that God has for us and you know we, we move on to other responsibilities. What is it through our, done through our ministry that is going to keep them strong in God? Well, here Paul talks about the word of his grace. So Paul had done this work so well, he had imparted the word of God and he trusted that now that there is a deposit of the word of God in the lives of these leaders and others, that that is what will build them up.
that is what will give them an inheritance among those who are being sent those who are sanctified verse 32 says so uh, let's do the same when we are building people up what are the raw materials that will give them that spiritual strength the word of god you know sometimes uh, what happens is coming to the world that we live in uh, these days people want something exciting all the time people want something new people want something that will um, uh, you know appeal to their senses so as ministers we do feel the pressure to try and keep things exciting you know, for for others however uh, we must not fall into this temptation uh, by compromising on the truth of God's word. Uh, even when it comes to the presentation of, of God's word, we need to be careful. You know, how are we presenting it? Uh, is it accurate? Is it going to build people up? Uh, are they going to uh, depend on the word of God in order to live their lives and do their ministries? So these are all questions we need to ask. Now, we can just be uh, nice uh, and uh, exciting by I'm just giving you an example like people like uh, uh, the most current technology people like uh, to to talk about whatever is uh, currently going on in in the uh, world okay relevance now in order for us to keep up with the trends around us uh, it doesn't mean that we should compromise the word of God. Now, some people may prefer that, you know, a church, the sermons have to be very motivational. Every Sunday, those sermons must uh, help us believe that we can get anything, we can do anything. So these are some expectations that people come with. Now, just because people come with these expectations and uh, we want to be relevant to uh, you know the crowds that are coming in we cannot compromise on the the strong solid teaching of god's word now people may find some portions of what we are teaching somewhat boring or um, uninteresting uh, but these are these are things that uh, you know we've got to accept not everything is going to be exciting uh, and not everything is going to try to draw the crowd now why is it that you know, we, we want to stick to the uh, accurate word of God or in another place, you know, Paul talks about rightly dividing the word of God. So the reason why we've got to do this is what verse 32 says here. Now, he now, as he is departing, is in a position to say that I commend you to God and to his word. At least he is uh, confident of the fact that what the people need, which is the word, he has already imparted it to them in a proper way now whether they uh, were excited about the way he taught or they didn't you know all that is, is secondary but the core matter is to impart the word into the people because that ultimately is what is going to strengthen them that ultimately is what is going to keep uh, you know uh, there is responsible for their sanctification so these are all very uh, it's like a tall order and uh, Paul does not hesitate to talk about these matters and uh, also he goes on to clarify that he was very responsible uh, he did not take from people uh, notice how verse 33 he says I've not coveted uh, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel Okay. Now, again, in all these thoughts are very challenging for us because when we are in a position of leadership, uh, somewhere we could, if we want to, we, we, we can use that position to exploit people. Even in the area of here, he's pointing out finances. Uh, but he's saying, look, I have been responsible. I did not try to uh, want and get what others have. But he says, uh, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. So he labored. Okay, we all know that he was a tent maker. So if you want to call it uh, something like, a, a, you know, like a marketplace uh, person, that's that's also 
uh, Paul's, uh, what what can you say? He was a full. He was not really like a full-time minister because he also had a job uh, through which he was making money. So you know uh, his uh, exposure was to ministry as well as the workplace. So that is how uh, he served the Lord, and he did not count uh, work as unnecessary. Why did he do that? He's explaining. He's saying, "I wanted to be self-sufficient, and you know, I did not want to depend on anyone. Uh, and uh, this is how I have lived. I've provided for myself. I've also provided for others." So uh, the point I'm trying to make is, when there is leadership, there is influence. Now, if we are not careful and if we are not accountable to God, um, there is a tendency. To use it to gratify our, our own needs, uh, our own desires, and exploit people. Now that is something that we must be, uh, you know, uh, alert about, cautious about, and not get into stuff like that. It's unfortunate uh, that uh, sometimes we see all these things happening around us, where leadership uh, in in the ministry is used to take from people. Right, uh, but that is so wrong because that's not the example which Paul had. Uh, in fact, he tried his best to take care of himself so that he is not a burden to others. Okay, now I'm not uh, trying to say that uh, uh, this this means that the people should not bless their leaders uh, or bless their elders. Of course, they they can, they must. We have other scriptures for that, but uh, right now we're talking about covetousness and we're talking about uh, you know, taking uh, in in an unrighteous way from people, which is wrong. So uh, Paul gives a very clear explanation about you know how he managed that, and of course towards the end we see the demonstration of his tender love uh, towards the elders. This gives us a good picture of how. Uh, Paul related to the people. You no, know, he could have being an apostle, being this man who is sought after with many, many leaders uh, groomed and nurtured under him. Uh, he could have just been an authoritarian figure. He could have just, you know, been so um, uh, emotionally distant from the people, teach them the word, and 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 leave. But shows us a little bit more about his personality okay it seems like uh, he was very uh, emotionally connected to the people as well uh, and uh, that uh, he spent a lot of time with these people he really loved these people so in verse 36 uh, it says when he had said these things he knelt down and prayed with them all verse 37 then all they all wept freely and fell on paul's neck and kissed him sorrowing most of all uh, for the words which he spoke that they would see his face no more and they accompanied him to the ship so they also fellowshiped uh, they also showed love and uh, uh, affection towards one another so uh, we'll stop here and uh, i just thought we can discuss a couple of thoughts from here you know we've seen so many statements made by paul uh, and we've seen what leadership looks like as far as he's concerned. So uh, any of your comments to add to this or any questions? Or anything that touched you? Um, I'll just share what, what has yes. touched me uh, about Paul uh, when he uh, the way he says to look at himself uh, like how that confidence that he has when he goes and says people like uh, follow my example uh, this is how you should lead the church I feel like uh, he has trained himself so much there's a verse where he says uh, I train myself like someone in the military so that I don't feel uh, unworthy after I feel um, we just listen to this word that I'm like the confidence that they have. Uh -huh. Jeffina, sorry to interrupt you. In some places, your voice is not coming through. 
Oh, I have no idea what's that. Yeah, now we can. Is it clear now? Yeah, we can. Yeah. So I just feel that uh, the confidence that he has while preaching is because he has really followed the word, and uh, that inspires me. Uh, tells me, I just tell myself, even I should do that, because so that we don't feel unworthy after preaching the word. Um, uh and and i have been there uh sometimes i preach and i'm like oh, do i really do this <laughs> or not uh but uh i think we we should definitely uh follow the word we should be first convinced that what we are preaching uh, is the truth and i think that that's what makes uh, a great impact when we go and preach the word so that's one thing that always inspires me Yeah, thank you, Jeffina. That's so true. So he was very confident uh, because he had lived it, he had followed it, he could confidently speak about it to others. And that inspires us. Any other thoughts that may have touched you about Paul and his example, the way he led other leaders? Please do share, it makes the class more interesting. Okay, um, maybe one more person. Um, yes, Elias. yeah, uh, I just like the way how you feel, you know, he was emotionally connected, uh, to the leaders because at times, you know, like, um, like we may be working for certain uh leaders, but we don't feel connected to them, we feel distant for them. And, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, it's such an encouragement to know that, like, Paul was emotionally connected to them and he loved them and, you know, how he mentored them is such an inspiring. Yes, thank you, Zeli. Yeah, we can see that here, emotional connectedness. Otherwise, why would they, you know, the, they kiss each other and cry together? Uh, so that's what it demonstrates. Uh, well, uh, just want uh, to state this one point. Now, different people have different personalities and uh, their way of relating uh, with others is uh, it's not at the same level as far as emotional emotional connectedness uh, is uh, but you know even even the most let's say uh, uh, a person who's not that emotional there is there is uh, some part of their emotions that loves the people at least that much is required because if we don't love the people I remember in uh, Kingdom Builders, uh, I, maybe, oh yeah, you've done it in the last uh, last year. There is a section where it says that uh, for a Kingdom Builder, people must be, we must carry people in our hearts. So that is very important. Now, if we only do the work of the ministry as a task or an assignment, uh, that won't suffice. God wants us to love people. He wants us to carry people in our hearts. So that is necessary. Now, the emotional demonstration of that depends on each person's, you know, uh, style of leadership, each person's personality and all that. Now, we're not asking everyone to be, you know, very uh, emotional. But that, that at least that initial level of carrying people in our hearts, loving them in our hearts, that is so very crucial. Uh, now, we could even talk about uh, this is the healthy part but the unhealthy part would be to kind of uh, go way beyond right uh, when it comes to emotional connectedness so there is a balance uh, but at least uh, some amount of uh, uh, emotional connectedness is required okay yeah uh, any other any other thoughts about paul's leadership that may have touched you we'll take up uh, one more and then we will move on
I'll share one more. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, about Paul's leadership, uh, even how he focuses uh, on others to build others. Like, uh, I just love how he trains Timothy. Uh, it's it's just so beautiful because uh, uh, the book of Timothy has uh, has encouraged me a lot. Uh, like, I feel like I'm sometimes I feel like I'm very young, uh, and then how how he encourages Timothy, like, just because of your age, don't feel like uh, you can't do this. And it just encourages young people a lot. And uh, I think that's that's very beautiful and very rarely leaders do that to go to a young people uh, and give them the leadership. Uh, and it's it's quite hard uh, to trust a young one even, right? <laughs> uh, like, when, when, when we see people, they've had experiences, we, we are like, okay, they have that experience, they can do this. But then to trust a young one uh, who's just stepping out into this teenage and all this stuff, just so beautiful. And uh, how Paul being a spiritual father, a spiritual mother guides them. And I, I think that takes a lot of patience, definitely. <laughs> a lot of patience, a lot of teaching, a lot of trust. And and I just feel like Paul is just ready to do anything. Like, uh, he just wants to do something for God. And uh, whatever way he can do it, through whatever opportunities he gets, he just, he just makes uh, use of it. And he don't, he don't think like, it's only I who have to do it, but he's ready to give it to others. Uh, he's ready to give it, uh, to, uh, train them up, uh, build uh, that that mindset that he has, as we always say, that kingdom mindset. To uh, even just now, you're saying uh, he just understood the importance of word. That it's it's the word that's gonna stay with the people forever. It's not us. So all these things just. Uh, just gives a bigger picture of the kingdom. That's what I feel like. Paul gives the bigger picture. It's not just about just telling the gospel, but then there are so many things uh, behind it. And all this, his life, he has set an amazing uh, example in, in his life. And I just pray that <laughs> we all could set such examples to our future generation. When they look at us, they will also uh, feel stirred up, feel passionate uh, to work for the kingdom. And yeah. Very true. We set a, a good example and a very uh, strong example when we observe his life. It uh, inspires us to lead well. Uh, and so, you know, we can just also take time to meditate on uh, the the life of Apostle Paul, because this course, while we are looking at uh, the Book of Acts, we're also considering the life of Apostle Paul and uh, looking at uh, all all that God did in and through him. So what a contrast, isn't it? Uh, here's a man who was passionate uh, uh, as a persecutor. Now that he is transformed, now that he is in the kingdom of God, he is saved. Uh, he is passionate for the people of God, from a persecutor to uh, uh, you know, a passionate lover of God's word and God's people. Uh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing what God can do in somebody's life. So uh, let's remember this. There are many such examples of good leadership uh, in the Bible. So Acts 20 and Paul's time with the Ephesian elders uh, is a passage to go to and uh, uh, meditate on quite often. So oh, this also uh, reminds us that the church, as it was thriving, as it was uh, expanding into new regions, the governance style, do you recall earlier? You had only one Peter standing up, and then you eventually had a Peter and John, and you know then it went on to other apostles, and then slowly you had Paul and Barnabas. You, so it kind of continues the governance of the church the ministry, it's becoming more and more apostolic. So no wonder, you remember, Paul's calling is an apostolic calling. So that is now playing out. Uh, he may have started as a proclaimer of the word, a teacher of the word, but now he's touching regions. He's raising up many church plants uh, and appointing elders. Appointing elders is a very crucial part of apostolic ministry because uh, we... Uh, you know, it, it's not about one person. It's going to be about many, many people. But how do we engage these people? How do we uh, 
work with these elders how do we guide these elders uh, you know how do we uh, strengthen these elders? these are all questions that one needs to ask as far as apostolic ministry is concerned so uh, this also reveals to us the way the governance of the church has evolved and how apostolic ministry has become so evident now suddenly there are so many leaders uh, who are taking up responsibility they've been well equipped by paul and his team and the work is uh, just multiplying so even in our days uh, this is something that we must keep in mind you know how do we have more leaders and uh, work together with more leaders now let's now let's move on we saw how they were in uh, uh, Miletus or Miletus. Now, coming to chapter 21, where the journey continues, you would find that he will go and stop in all those other places that uh, I, I showed on the map. So let us see. From there, he will uh, move on to uh, Jerusalem, where he will be caught. So this is what will be covered in chapter 21. So uh, if one of us could... Uh, Go over, uh, read through from verse 1. Okay, there's quite a lot here. I don't want you to get confused. Uh, verse 1 to verse 14. You could uh, read. I'll, I'll summarize it for us. Yeah, 21. Chapter 21. Now it came to pass that when... We had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course. We came to Kos, the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyra. For there the ship was unloaded was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul, so they spilled not to go up to Jerusalem. When he had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we aborted the ship and they returned home. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyra, we came to, to Ptolemas, <laughs> we came to Ptolemas, <laughs> greeted the brethren and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now this man who had four virgin daughters who prophesied, prophesied and we stay, and as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down to Judea. When, we, when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind a man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, when we had these things, both we and those from the place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when we would not pass, when he would he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying this will of the Lord be done. Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Lubega, for reading that whole passage. Do quite a few names there. So I will explain them to us, uh, but then how about we just go for a break now and uh, we come back at 10 and then uh, I, it, I mean, with the continuation, I'd be able to uh, share better. So let's go for a break right now. Thank you.